But listen, I, I shared this. I shared this last week, and, and thankfully, thankfully, we had some had some fruit from it. But I want to I want to say it again. I give you I give you permission. Okay, after weeks of not being able to hang and preach to people, I give you permission to be a little bit more vocal tonight. So I, I, know, I know some of you aren't used to that, and that's okay. But listen, you're, you're, you're welcome. And, and if there's a moment you want to boo me too, like bring that too, all right? But tonight we're going to charge uh, the gates of hell, starting right where we left off from last week. If your mind is intoxicated by the things of this world, the purpose of your life will be hollow. Uh, Last week, we we saw Paul's commissioning of Timothy to be sober-minded. And we talked about the opposite side of that is, is being intoxicated by the things of this world. Now, we had a really, really interesting Lot family discussion on Sunday. Uh, I, I personally have never been intoxicated from alcohol, and that's a conviction thing that God had convicted me many years ago, and, and so I, I've, uh, I've, I haven't gotten drunk, and so I, I asked uh, our law family, for those that, uh, that have gotten drunk before, like, like wh- what are the effects? What are the effects? Because if, if Paul's talking about being sober-minded, uh, then certainly the antithesis, the opposite of that, is intoxicated. So, so I asked, like, what, what are some of the effects of being intoxicated? And some of you relate to this. Uh, the, the first they said is there's like this, this numbing to the pain kind of effect, right? Like it, it, just, it just seems to, to numb the cares of this world. Well, well the problem with that is is, is what if our pain now was being used as another pathway to Jesus? And so being sober-minded is the recognition that here and now, until he returns, there is going to be pain, right? And that pain, another mechanism and means by which to go to him. And so by being intoxicated, by the things of this world, it takes you away from Christ. Uh, the, the second thing uh, that uh, my law family shared, some of the folks uh, shared, in particular from their, some of their pre-Jesus days, uh, their drunken ways, is, is that it, it, it takes like the, the worries. There, there's a forgetfulness about the, the present worries. And, and so again, you, you think about the effects of being intoxicated on our flesh and how it causes this forgetfulness about the present worry. When the scripture says that, that we're to take our anxieties to Jesus. And so by being sober minded, we see some of the worry rise in us. And, and then it takes us to the power of Christ yet again. And finally, um, this really interesting law family discussion. I wish you could have been there. When was the last time you talked about, okay, so what are all the effects of being drunk? Um, they, they said you grow more confident. And, and some of you have experienced this, right? You talked to that, uh, that, that girl or that guy, and, and you were scared to do that many, many times before, but intoxicated, all of a sudden there was this rise of confidence. And so similarly now, what if confidence with a sober mind was meant to lead us to the understanding of what Christ was doing in us and what he had given us through his Holy Spirit instead of growing in fleshly confidence. The more you're intoxicated by your flesh, the more you will grow in a fleshly confidence. And so the effects of that is that it leads to this this hollow kind of purpose uh, many of you know what that feels like, right? You've had years or weeks or months intoxicated on the things of this world, and you've, you've been awakened every single morning wondering what in the world your life is all about. Well, the reason why this is significant is because we have a man who's in chains in Rome who is thinking back He's not just reminiscing 
but he's remembering. Paul is on the last days, months, weeks. We're not exactly sure of the timeline, but he's, he's on the end of his life. In chapter 4, the last chapter that he'll ever write in the Scripture, after having penned inspired by the Holy Spirit, two-thirds of the New Testament, now this final exhortation of Timothy. And what we're going to see in this text tonight is a sober-minded Paul, not intoxicated by his flesh, but a sober-minded Paul giving his own eulogy. Now, this is, this is, a, this is a odd reality. Uh, when you go to a funeral, you see people then stand up to commemorate or celebrate those that have passed. They give eulogies. I, I read the last several days some of the most famous eulogies ever to be given. It's interesting to think about some of the eulogies that I've given at funerals. But now Paul's still living, still breathing, days numbered. He's going to give his own eulogy, a living eulogy, which causes me to ask this question as we dive into tonight. If you had to give your own eulogy today, what would you say? Mark, this is morbid. No, it's actually challenging, maybe even convicting, maybe even eye-opening, right? Like, like if I went around the room one by one and I said, all right, so we're going we're gonna to do living eulogies of yourself. And, and you came up here with a mic and you had no notes, like it was just off the cuff. What is it that you would say about your life? Most times people give eulogies. They, they talk about trophies. Not, not like little league, you know, third grade, we, we, you know, we won the two-team league. Not, not those kinds of trophies, but most times when you hear eulogies, it's a, it's a recollection of all of the great accomplishments of someone's life. And so I would imagine some of you would come up and the first instinct out of you would be to talk about the trophies. The, the wealth that you accrued, the great career you had, the relationships that you were awarded, right? Uh, other times, you, you'll hear tragedy talked about, especially when someone has passed in a tragic way and there's a, an addressing of the tragedy or past tragic moments. And so some of you giving a living eulogy, you would, you would come up and you would, you'd walk through all the, the various tragedies that you have gone through. I've heard over and over and over, okay, and I know you guys have seen this as well, at funerals when eulogies are given, it's a, it's a collection of traits, and, and sometimes a bit of a stretch, right? Come on, have you ever been to a funeral where, where someone's given a eulogy and there's going, they're going through all the traits of the person and you're like, that, that one's not true. Like, somebody just trying to be nice, right? And I've mentioned this before, you ain't never been to a funeral where someone said, well, uh, they did not believe in Jesus and they are in hell. Like, you've never heard that at a funeral. I guarantee you what you have heard is they're in a better place, they're in a better place, they're in a better place, right? So it's this recollection of traits. I'm wondering if you came up here to give your living eulogy, the remembrance of your life, the significance of your purpose, I'm wondering what you would say. Well, tonight, um, we get to see what Paul says. Anyone who knows my story knows that these three verses have a impactful place in my life. I would say that when we started this journey of 2 Timothy, I was thankful that God led us to this letter, and from week one, I had been anticipating this night. However, I was sharing with John today that I have battled. And the reason I battled in preparation is that I have desired to not make this story about what God has done in my life through this text. But all I desire to do is to make much of Jesus in it and through it. 
And so trying to like distance that has been really hard because these verses played such a vital role in my life. But God has brought me to a great place. After a lot of toil, I invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's start here in verse 6. Paul's living eulogy. He says in verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Speaking of things you've never said before, it's this statement. Has there ever been a conversation that you've had with someone where they've come up to you and they said, oh, hello, I just want to share with you, I'm, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. Okay. This, this, is, this is not common language that we use. And so we need to try to understand what it is that he's saying. Now, why does, why does Paul say this? The, the origination of drink offering comes from Genesis chapter 35 where we see a Jacob setting up a stone altar to remember how God had spoke at Bethel, he ends up calling the place. And over that stone altar, Jacob pours a drink offering as a means of remembrance and celebrating and inviting God's presence into that place. That was the origination. Well, starting there, we see an entire Old Testament filled with the concept of drink offering, probably the most significant, though, in Numbers chapter 15. In Numbers 15, we see this progression of a grain offering and a burnt offering leading to a drink offering. And let me explain the significance. The grain would be put on the altar and oftentimes them then a lamb following it. That would be burned and you can imagine the the barbecue kind of scene. Now if you've ever been at a bonfire, a campsite, anywhere and there's been a fire and you take some kind of water or liquid and you chuck and duck on the fire, what happens? Like you get some some smoke, right? Like there's some sizzle to it. Okay, so, so this was the effect of the drink offering, is the lamb would be on the altar, the grain is there, and then all of a sudden the fire is doused with a hin of wine, and, and when that would happen, it would, it would smoke. And so the thought in the Old Testament is that that would be an aroma to the Lord. It was an act of worship. And some of you are like, well, what, what, is, what does that have to do with with Paul. Well, this isn't the first time that he mentions drink offering, and this has my heart. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 17. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am, what's the word there? Come on. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Now, this is long before 2 Timothy 4, when he writes Philippians. He he says, even if I am to be poured out. Well, now you have all of those years in between where we see, listen to this, his willingness to be a sacrifice. And now in 2 Timothy 4, we see the fruition And that has caused me to take a step back. I believe there is a great distance and disconnect between what we would say is our willingness and what we see come to fruition in obedience. Let me say it this way. I think we have two options as it comes to willingness to obey the Lord. I am willing, Lord, and where the majority of us find ourselves, the majority of the time, I am willing, Lord, I promise, but I am so taken back by years before, Paul writes 2 Timothy 4, we see his willingness 
God, I am willing to be poured out. Church in Philippi, I am willing to be a sacrifice if it means, if it means the gospel gets to you. And then uh, when he writes the letter uh, to the church in Philippi, he's in prison then too. How beautiful is it that his willingness precedes the eventual fruition of his execution and death? Come on. Now where we find ourselves is, well, yeah, Lord, I'm willing but it's, it's really going to have to line up with a whole lot of things. God, I'm willing as, as long as it doesn't mean i got to sell nothing or give up anything or sacrifice this list that you hand to the Lord. Oh, God, I am willing as long as it means I don't need to lose any kind of friendship or relationship. God, I am willing as long as it means I ain't got to share the gospel. I'm willing, but, but, but. And listen, we have thought in our minds that that is somehow less of a rebellion against God, the I am willing but. We have in, in our minds misconstrued what that kind of disobedience is. And I wanna clear it up tonight. We are either saying yes, Lord, or, or, or no, Lord. That's it. Those are the two options. So when you say I am willing but, you're just saying no, Lord. Not interested. I'd rather not follow you. Uh, but Mark, no, no, I want to follow him, it's just with conditions. Again, we're, we're con giving conditions to the one who sits on the throne? Come on. I, I love, I love that we see Paul empowered by the Holy Spirit telling the church in Philippi from prison, I am willing, and then years later we see the fruition of his willingness. God, make us willing. Any ways we've approached you with trepidation, make us willing, God. Any fears that are holding back obedience tonight, make us willing, God. Any conditions we put upon your throne, make us willing. Oh, what the Lord can do with a son or daughter who looses the grip of their perceived control and just says, do whatever you want with my life, God. I'm willing, whatever. Send me wherever, do whatever, I'll sell whatever, I'll go wherever. To your name be the glory. Ser seriously, right now, come on. Imagine if every single person in this room just was like, I'm whatever. <laughs> Listen, there would be some radical things happening tonight. Radical. Because some of you would be like, I've been ignoring this nudge. I've been ignoring this call or command. I've been ignoring this commissioning on my life for days, weeks, months. And if all of a sudden the control, the perceived control was loose, it would be go time now. And listen, some of you spouses, I, I can see you like nudging each other because you're like, we've been having these kind of conversations, but it seems like fear is driving your life. Oh, to see this man infiltrated by the Holy Spirit, watch a willingness come to fruition. I love this. I want to make sure you understand this. No one says, yes, Lord, because they are able. Somebody needs to hear this. I will never say, yes, Lord, because Mark Sigma can say yes. I won't say I'm willing, Lord, because I've got the strength. You guys understand what I'm saying? Paul, the focus will never be on him. Anyone who says, yes, Lord, puts God in them on complete display. Because left to my own devices, it'll be no, Lord. It'll be willing, but. It'll be conditional, obedience. But you in me, God. Woo! The seatbelt comes off. We're charging the gates of hell. And there's no turning back. Him in us. So I, I, listen, the reason why this is so significant is again, I remind you, I, anytime I study Paul, I'm just like, I wanna be that dude, I wanna be that dude, I wanna be that dude. And what, what Christ consistently reminds me of is, what are you talking about? Y you have me in you. The same spirit that was in the apostle Paul, though you may have some different callings at times, the same spirit resides in you, Mark. So the focus isn't Paul or Peter, or Andrew, it's on the Spirit of God in us. Does that make sense? Because seriously, when I, when I look at verse 6, I'm like, man, to have that kind of strength and courage, where is he getting that strength and courage? It, it's not because he's drinking the equivalent of Jerusalem Mountain Dew, man. He's got the Holy Spirit in him. I'll never say that again, Lord. Now look at this. 
Look at this. That leads then to this challenge from Romans 12. He's not just going to embrace it himself. He's going to challenge the church with it. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. It's a mercy to embrace this, to present your bodies as a what? Living sacrifice right now. Willingness. God, I'm ready and willing. I'm scared, Lord. I need your strength. Making this decision, it causes a deep amount of worry in me. God, take the worry away. Give me strength, Lord. I guarantee you right now, there are decisions all over this room that we are holding back on that you know are from God because it's clear in his word and fear is driving your decision making. A living sacrifice, he says, holy and acceptable to God, which is your, let's read it together, spiritual worship. It's the what? The aroma. So that same perspective of Paul being a drink offering, it's aroma to the Lord because we're saying, God, we have nowhere else to go. All we need is you. You're our king. And that is, it's pleasing to him, we see in scripture. Now, some of you are like, Mark, this, this doesn't relate to me. Okay. Maybe the end will of verse six. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I'd like to ask now in a moment of uh, interaction, feel free to shout it at home. What strikes you about the after comma part of this text? Does anything strike anyone here? Is there a word that sticks out to anyone? Come on. Don't be shy. You might be wrong, but don't be shy. Come on. Is it, does anyone else see the word departure here? Paul, Paul doesn't say, and the end has come. So I shall go in Pete. My departure. I got places to go. I got a king to worship. Now listen to this. This Greek word is only used a time in the entire New Testament. Okay. It refers to the moorings connected to a boat. Anyone who's ever been boating before? Okay, a few of you. You know that when you're docked, there is rope that connects you to the dock. So this word, really significant to Paul because he's been on a few boats. All right. It literally means that the ropes are loosed from the boat and the boat starts to move away from the dock. Come on. So in this graphic image, Paul has in his mind this moving of the boat from his life in the here and now to his life in the eternal. I got, I got a place to go. I got a king to serve, which makes me say this. Those that are sure of their standing say this. Those that are sure of their standing in Christ do not agonize over death. In a world, in a time, in a season where we see death so feared. Christian, you, listen, it's time to get very real. Oh, I don't fear death. But when I have that weird pain in my arm, I don't sleep for three nights. I don't fear death. Everything's fine. Anybody? Anybody? I, I, don't, I don't fear death, but I'll tell you what, I'm pretty much gonna build an absolute fortress around my life. I added like six seatbelts in my car just in case, right? I'm not saying we're not to be good stewards of the here and now. I'm not saying that we're all of a sudden to live lacklusterly or carelessly. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying when you're sure of your relationship with Jesus, there's no agony over death. Even, even in the utmost pieces of pain. There's no agony. Do you see him agonizing here? No, he, he's like, listen, the time for my departure has come. Loose the ropes. It's time to go. Right. It's time to go. I love, love 
old, seasoned, faithful saints. Anybody else? Now, Heidi's grandpa, Heidi's grandpa is an absolute beast in Christ, okay? Beast in Christ. He is 91 years old, all right? And that dude is like, he's a farmer to the core, just an incredible, like gentle guy, strong man. He just got diagnosed with lung cancer, okay? And so we're walking through all of that. He, he got some good news today, but we went and visited him a couple weeks ago. You would never know, never know, that in this 91-year-old man is lung cancer. You would never know. With a smile on his face, there is no agony over death. And some of you are like, yeah, he's 91. I mean, it's time, right? No, no. It's in that moment that you see some old seasoned folks all of a sudden get deeply fearful. Come on now. Not Heidi's grandpa. I mean, we're, we're talking about cancer and sickness. He's just talking about it as if it's matter of a fact. Lord, when it's time, take me. They exist instead with a sense of urgency in life. They don't agonize over death, which takes a ton of time out of your life. Anybody? I've shared before, I had, I had a nodule in my throat that I got worried about for a season of time. We had just lost a friend to cancer. All of a sudden, that nodule in my throat, I basically conceived in my mind. And it took two months of sleepless nights, two months of sleepless nights and worry out of me. It was all I could think about. Anybody relate? So there's no urgency of life there. It's just agonizing over death. And I confess that as I longed to trust God in that time and I was battling, battling. But instead, these kinds of folks, they exist with a sense of urgency. Well, it's in that urgency then, it's in that reality that Paul in this living eulogy says likely the most famous verse that he's ever communicated about his life in the scripture. 2 Timothy chapter four, verse seven. Let's read it together. I fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. The unlearned say this is haughty and prideful. Those without a framework for the scripture call this arrogance. But those that with the right framework of doctrine, those that have seen Paul's heart, those that can piece his writings together say, oh no. This is a man that fully recognizes what God has done in his life. In this living eulogy, what Paul says is, look what he's done. Look what he's done. He took a wretch, a former persecutor, and he gave him a fight to fight. Listen, look, look what he's done. He gave a non-runner a race to run. He gave him purpose. He says, oh, look what the king has done. He gave faith and trust to someone that was faithless, only faithful in himself. Look what God's done. That's what he says. Well, I'm thankful for the athletic imagery. Any athletes in here, or as my kids call me, former athletes, Appreciate the laughter there, thank you so much. And it was just, Sawyer, I heard that. Just, just yesterday, just yesterday, my son Dawson called me former athlete again, okay? So I, I appreciate the athletic talk, and so does Paul. Let's be reminded of some of these other places in the text where he talks about these same kind of concepts in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, do you not know, long before his death, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So he says, so run that you may obtain it. Every athlete, he says in verse 25, exercises self-control in all things. If you're going to get better, there's a level of self-control and effort. They do it to receive a perishable wreath but we, come on now, an imperishable. Don't you love this? He's like talking about all these things and then he gets to the end 
and he gets to celebrate the fruition of his willingness. You guys see, this is incredible stuff. So he says, look at this, verse 26. I do not run aimlessly as one who's intoxicated by the things of the world. I run with a sober mind. I do not box as one beating the air, which is the only, only time I will ever box is against the air. I would faithfully lose in verse 27, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. Look at this. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Come on. He's like, I, he's like, I, I, don't, I don't just want to be a preacher of the word and then walk away. No, my, my life needs to show the power of Christ. So let's break all three of these statements down together. Let's begin with, I have fought the good fight. What I want to ask is, how is it a fight, this relationship with God that we have? How is it a fight? This is going to be the wake-up call portion of the evening. Because some of you right now are living a very conditional, cultural faith that does not feel like a fight at all. The problem is, the scripture makes clear that those who desire to follow Jesus are in a fight. How is it a fight? Well, first, it's a fight because we have an enemy. When, when you have an enemy, it's a fight. There's an enemy, there's an adversary, there's a, a devil, there's a, a roaring lion that's looking for someone to devour. Okay. And when you got an enemy that's on the offense, which is what our enemy is, as we've been saying ever since the fall, he wants us dead, he has murderous intent. When you have that kind of enemy, then you are in a fight. Like we talked about a couple weeks ago, the problem is believers most often find themselves on the field of battle with no weapon. Because we're like, where's the fight? Oh, it's Satan again. Great. Let's, you know, we're going to dance together. This is awesome. We're going to hop on the merry-go-round. This is great. No. We're in a fight. We have an enemy. Not just that. We have the old man, the used to be us. The before Jesus, the flesh. Anybody still battling with the flesh? Anybody? Okay. I raise both my hands and thank you. All right, for that honest. I mean, but Paul in Romans 7, he says, why do I do what I don't want to do and don't do what I do do? And oh, you can read it later, okay? It's a really confusing text. But, but essentially what he's saying is, why in the world do I have these desires and go against them? And the reason is, it's because the old man, the used to be us, the flesh that is not yet perfected. And so because that still resides, we're in a battle. We're in a fight. And finally, it's a fight because we exist in a Christ-rejecting world, as we've been talking about. You put those three, you put those three things together, is it, I mean, right now is the wake-up call. If you don't feel like you're in a fight, it's probably because you ain't following the Jesus of the Scripture. Because if you are, it is a fight and a battle. So what, what is Paul saying then when he says, I fought the good fight? What's the good fight? Check this out. Paul is saying... Through Christ in me, Satan was my enemy, not my friend. Come on. I raged war against my flesh. I was in the world, but not of it. That's what he's saying is fighting the good fight. I called Satan my enemy. I wasn't looking to befriend him. I fought. I wanted to kill the sin in me and took my sin to the person who could kill it and that was the power of Jesus. I didn't flirt with my sin. Yes, he battled. He was not yet perfected. People ask me all the time, was Paul sinless? No, he was sinful. We don't see a ton of record of it. We do see some mentions for sure. He definitely battled with sin. And finally, I was in the world but not of it. I existed in it. I was around it but I didn't compromise. I didn't shrink back. That's what it means to fight the good fight. But please see it again, it's Christ in him. The hero now is not Paul. It's the heroics of a God through a former persecutor. Now secondly, I have finished the race, he says. <laughs> and uh, I've talked previously before, I'm not gonna go into the whole story, but how many of you guys have run a marathon here just so we can see the people Okay, come on, this is your moment right now. You don't need a belt, just, yeah. 
Okay? All right, so six, six of us were really highly um, marathoned here, okay? <laughs> so, Krebs, did you raise your hand? No, who, okay, I'm sorry. So, what, how big was your, how long was your marathon? 26 point. You ran the full? Dear heavens, okay? And you're still living? How, do you mind me asking what your time was? You don't talk about that, okay. Well, let me tell you what I talk about. I ran a half marathon, and I say ran really loosely, okay? But I ran a half marathon, and my time, you ready for this, was three hours and five minutes, okay? Preschoolers can ride a tricycle faster than three hours and five minutes, okay? I, I just say that to say, take it from experience, it's hard to finish the race. It's hard to finish. So what I want to ask is, how is it a race? We just looked at how is it a fight. How is it a race? Well, the first thing is that training is necessary. Anybody who wants to run well, you got to train, period. It's the same illusion that he was talking about in 1 Corinthians 9. You want to run well, you got to train. Oh, I want to run the race apart from the word. Oh, I want to run the race with no discipleship. Oh, I want to... No. Listen, it's like a football team going out with no practice. And they come to the huddle, and the quarterback's like, oh, well, so here, yeah, here's what we're going to do. You're going to go here. Remember on the playground where you, like, drew up plays in the sand, and it never went according to plan? Like, Like, that's what a lack of practice does, a lack of training. It's chaos. There's training involved. Again, okay, as an admonition, when I trained for the half marathon, I used that term loosely, okay? Should have trained much more, obviously, okay? I also shouldn't have bought new shoes on the day before. That's a whole other story, okay? <laughs> second thing, that was some judgment there in that laugh. Second thing, <laughs> second thing, okay? You work for a shoe store or something, okay? It's okay. <laughs> the second thing, why is it a race? Is because endurance is required. Endurance is required. If you say, oh, oh, I want to follow Jesus, and you have zero interest in enduring, like we talked about last week, it is so much easier to start than it is to finish. Endurance is required. That's why it's a race. One of the first sermons I ever preached as a pastor in my post-youth ministry days, John, maybe you remember your first, okay? Well, that's how pastors talk. So what was your first? You know, the first post-youth ministry sermon, okay? Well, my first was at Two Rivers, and the whole title of the sermon was The Race of Pace. And I got showbiz balls, and we, like, threw them all over the crowd, and afterwards people said, you're still a youth pastor, and I said, okay, maybe so, but it's a race that requires endurance. It's a race of pace. And finally, number three, running free is essential if you were going to try to run the race with like 10 pound weights on your ankles or a massive sack on your back or some sort of contraption that was pulling you, weighing you down, you, you would run at a much more hindered way. Running free is essential. So here's what he's saying. Through Christ in me, I have finished the race because I have endured. Through trial, tribulation, temptation, and persecution, I've endured. Through Christ in me, not me, Christ in me. The significance of running free, look at what the writer of Hebrews says in verse 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us, look, run with endurance, endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. If you want to run with that shame, if you're interested in running hindered, you will not endure. Which is why you hear so often us teaching, there is no condemnation in Jesus. The power of the gospel is he looses the grip of the former used to be. The way the sin presses down on your shoulders and he says, run free. Run free. 
So I fought the good fight. It's a fight. I finished the race. It is a race. And then finally, at the end of verse 7, I have kept the faith. I want to read a text for you. At the beginning of our journey, in 2 Timothy, I shared this text with you then. I share it with you now. When he says, I have kept the faith, here's what he's saying. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys. In danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at the sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And so when he says, I picture him with tears, penning his living eulogy, when he says, I have kept the faith. He's saying, when the tribulation came, I trusted you, Jesus. And as the lashes opened up my back, I turned to you, Christ. And when I got spat on, when I was tempted to quit, there was a new resolve through your spirit. What Paul is saying is the hardships fueled through the Holy Spirit, my trust. It didn't tear it down. So why, oh why, friend, does it appear in American Christianity that the hardships drive us away from the Lord instead of to him? And so he says to a man that will read this in Ephesus, I have fought the good fight, Timothy. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. Now, before we look at what he says next, I want to introduce a concept before we look at verse 8 to you. A couple weeks ago when we were teaching through righteousness, I told you that there were two kinds of righteousness. There was an imputed kind of righteousness. That imputed righteousness is when Christ's righteousness is counted as ours. And then there was an imparted righteousness where our progressive growth through the Holy Spirit's power was seen in God making us more like him. Now I want to introduce again those two terms before we look at verse 8 here in a second so that we can enjoy what Paul says first beginning in Colossians 1. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Look at this. If indeed you what? Come on. Continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel you heard. Endurance is necessary. Endurance comes as Christ makes us righteous. He makes us more like himself. And when he makes us more like himself, what do we see in the person of Jesus? Come on. 
in the garden of Gethsemane, doing what? Praying droplets of blood. And where does he get to? Endurance, all the way. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Here's what he's saying. Through Christ in me, though my flesh is weak, Jesus gave me faith. Though my trials were great, Jesus helped me trust. Though tempted to quit, I endured. That's what it means to keep the faith. And so all of that said, finally in verse 8, the picture of righteousness already painted. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also, let's read it together, to all who have loved his appearing. The crown of righteousness imparted Christ's righteousness to us. The righteousness that is growing us, all leading to an eternal crown of righteousness. And some of you are like, oh sweet, this is finally, I've been waiting till we could talk about the crowns because I've always wondered what that was like in scripture. So Mark, can you tell me what kind of crown I'm going to get? Well, I'd rather tell you that in, um, in Revelation chapter four, when you read the 24 elders, I'd rather tell you what they do with that crown. If you want to read it later, you can, you'll get your face melted off. What the 24 elders do with their crowns is they take their crown and they lay it at the feet of the throne. That's what they do with their crown. You hear people, you know, all the time, the same folks who have really gotten obsessed with Left Behind back in the 90s, right? They're like, but what about my crown? What about my crown? I don't know. All I can tell you is the 24 elders lay him at the feet of Jesus. So here's what I want to ask. Coming full circle. As we look at the living eulogy of Paul. If you had to give your own eulogy today, I ask again, what would you say? Would it be filled with the trophies? Would your testimony be filled with the triumphs and the tragedies? I believe tonight, my friends, we have a new opportunity to begin writing a different kind of eulogy. The one that Paul embraces at the end of his life because there is a ton of evidence of one thing. Paul's living eulogy, shouting from the mountaintops, preached in every city that he planted a church, embraced to every disciple, including Timothy, that he invested in. His consistent living eulogy is look at Jesus, look what he's done. Look what he did through me. It was him, it wasn't me. He took a wretch, he took a persecutor. He took a used to be hater of the church and he did something with me like an artist, like a creator, like a king. Look at Jesus, look at him. He's beautiful, there's no one like him. No one else can do with you what he can. He gave my life purpose. He sobered my mind so the intoxication of my flesh didn't make me drunk. He he breathed life into me. He gave me a Holy Spirit. Look at him. Look what he did. I'm wondering, church, if all of a sudden we lived with a newfound understanding of what it will be like to look back Many of us will be there. Some of us will, in fact, be taken tragically or quickly. But some of us are going to have time. 
and we'll look back. I don't want to think on the trophies or the career path or the wealth accrued. I don't want the first thoughts in my mind to be the tragic moments, no. I am hopeful and prayerful that by the power of Christ in me, I can look back at a lineage, a timeline of when over and over and over, I continually said, look at Jesus, look at Christ. He's so good, He's, look, look what he did with me. A wretch, he did a miracle through me. If that became the living eulogy of the church, oh, the glory of God would be seen in our land anew. Under your seats, you have a cup and I invite you to take that cup now. And for those that are watching, I invite you to get your elements ready. If you just peel back that top layer and hold the wafer in your hand for a second. Don't take of it yet, just hold it tight. As Jesus breaks the bread on the night when he's betrayed, and he invites the disciples to take and eat, what he's inviting them into is a willingness, a life that will be spent pointing back to the power of Christ. And so when he said, when you eat this, remember, remember, church, that's what we get to do tonight. We get to remember the broken body of Jesus and what the power of Christ has done with wretches like us. So just the bread now, let's take and eat in remembrance of him, come on. If you can open the rest of the way. church. Knowing his departure, soon to be ascended to the glories of heaven, he looked at the disciples and he said, this represents the blood of the new covenant, a new kind of promise that's been perfectly fulfilled in me. And he says, drink this in remembrance of me, in remembrance of what Christ has done, of his saving power, of his grace. Let's share in this cup together. Come on, let's stand, come on, let's stand. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. For what reason does Paul say? So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the what? the power of God. That's our opportunity, church. The living eulogies saying, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look what he's done. Look what he's doing. We have a new opportunity, church, to embrace a new kind of life. For those who have been watching your life and its purpose slip through your hands, drunk on the things of this world, Let's sober up tonight and embrace what Christ has for us. Turn our attention, God, to you. Turn our attention to you. Stir our affection for you, God. Tonight, Lord, wake us up. Help us radiate you. Help us point every single person in our life to you, to 
to your beauty, to your renown, to your power. Radiate yourself in us, God.